Hello, I want to talk about Rousseau. Today's lecture will have fewer parts than the other ones. I think it's going to be easier in a way. I mean, for one thing, the Rousseau reading is difficult among the more archaic sort of texts that you'll find in this class. But I, I think I do have pretty good notes that are posted, so you can check that stuff out. I want to introduce Rousseau himself. Introduce, so there's two texts, right? The Discourse on Inequality and the social contract. They deal with different things, but they're related in a number of ways. I'm going to introduce the individual, and then I want to introduce what I think unites these texts. I'll tell you in general what I think each one is about, and then mostly what I want to do today is read a whole bunch of passages from these texts. I'll read the passages, and I'll give you some commentary, how I read that, what I think are the interesting questions that are raised from that. I want to clarify what Rousseau's positions are because a number of them are quite important. Okay, so let me start with, with Rousseau himself as a character. Rousseau's a Swiss political philosopher. He did a whole lot of stuff, actually. He, he wrote different forms of literature. He was a composer, fairly significant composer. He's probably the second most important person for codifying, you know, writing out and, and making into a system what we now think of as uh, the rules of uh, Western harmony. So he's a music theorist. He did all kinds of stuff. He's considered a, a romantic. What's, what's romantic about him is his, uh, his romanticization of the idea of, of nature, of uh, a wild situation where humans were purer and more innocent. You know, the whole idea of the noble savage is kind of a wishful idea that was had by intellectuals within a society that was increasingly industrial and, and urban. So there's this kind of compensatory valorization or valuation of the countryside and of nature and of things that are untouched. So this is the individual. He's from Switzerland and he's from a region in Switzerland where there had in fact been pretty long-lived practices of self-rule, of self-government. That's what democracy means, right? Uh, Krasi means, you know, I think power by the demos. Demos means the many. So he becomes this early, very prominent proponent of democracy as the form of government most suited to human beings, given that hum human beings are characterized and are distinguished from other animals by free will. Democracy is the only form of government which establishes control over a population, but it does so on the basis of the, the decision-making of that population. So in the same way that, say I make a decision that I'm going to go meet my friend for lunch tomorrow. That's my free will operating, right? But then tomorrow comes around and I kind of have a headache and I had an argument with my wife and like, I just feel like, I don't know, I just want to take a nap and skip lunch. But I should do it anyway because I, I made the choice, right? So decision making involves a moment of, of freedom, but then it's followed by a moment of compulsion. My having to go to lunch, however, is not the result of some tyrant determining what I should do it's the result of my own decision making. And my own decision doesn't have any meaning unless I follow through on it, right? There's plenty of people who nominally make decisions, but because they don't follow through on them, in the end, they were no decision at all, right? So the point is that to be free is not exclusive of having to obey because you have to obey yourself. And so what Rousseau wanted was a form of government where we freely decide as a body politic, he would call it, as a group, integrated group of people, we freely decide and then we follow the laws that we make. Democracy, even though it involves compulsion, even though it involves control and the making of law and so on, is still harmonious with human nature insofar as human nature has to do with making choices. Anyway, and so he had some experience with this in his background. That's all I'll give you for, for his context. Why is he important? He's important because he inspires members of especially the French Revolution. He's also important because, I'll show you in a couple of the passages, he really clearly leans towards Marx. And, and in general, he's one of the first people in this Western tradition, which we're looking at to begin with, who offers a, a critique 
of structures of, of rule and specifically criticizes the, the typical relationship between law and property. Maybe it's the case that law is actually put in place, not for the benefit of the masses, although we're always told that's what it's for, and actually the nature of law, uh, at least if it supposedly comes in a democratic situation, is that it supposedly reflects a universal interest, or at least the interest of the majority. But maybe even though law has that veneer, that facade, in the background, what's really determining law is the interests of the rich. So that's in the discourse on inequality, and that's really foundational to Marxism, and it's and that's therefore foundational for all the things that Marxism influences, which is you know a whole lot of theory, but also real revolutions for at least a hundred years. So you know he's important in a whole bunch of ways, but these are, these are kind of the the main ones. Now the overarching thing that you should be aware of in order to understand you know as a start each one of these texts, these two texts, is the concept of the social contract. Social contract theory is a favorite political, philosophical, explanatory mechanism, let's say in the period from 1600 to 1800, something like that. Uh, so there are, Rousseau is not the inventor of the social contract. In fact, you know, this manner of thinking about politics and basically what the social contract theory does whoever's using it, is it provides an answer to the question, where's government come from? And because it answers that question, it identifies nominally, it identifies like an original function of government. And at the same time as it identifies an original function of government, it therefore also identifies a legitimate function of government. So social contract theory answers the question, where does government come from? But in answering that question, it also sets up a standard by which existing governments can be measured and their legitimacy can be tested. If a government matches up with its alleged original function, then basically speaking, it's, it's legitimate. If it doesn't match up with that, if it doesn't do the thing that it was originally constructed to do, and if, you'll see, in the social contract, this original thing is always hypothetical. It's always kind of made up. But if it doesn't match, then it's illegitimate. So social contract theory is a way of thinking about government, about the legitimacy of government. And ultimately, it's also a framework for understanding what are the governments that need to be changed? What are the grounds for legitimate insurrection? So you can get real revolutionary thought out of Rousseau, and that's what the American and the French revolutionaries did. They used him in thinking through their own circumstance and as an ideological justification for what they wanted to do. Let me give you more details about social contract theory. Social contract theory always involves a movement between two places, but more two times. And they're sort of alleged times. Well, the first one is an alleged time. It's a conceived time. It may not have actually existed. And if you look carefully at Rousseau, you'll come across these strange words very close to the beginning of the discourse on inequality, where he says, but let us leave facts behind. That's pretty weird, right? He seems not to have a problem with that. In every theory of the social contract, oh, and what I was gonna say before is that, you know, even in Plato, which is 400 BCE, so, you know, 2,500 years ago, you can find in Plato's Republic, you can find social contract theory. So it's not original to Rousseau or, or even to the period 1600 to 1800. It's just very popular then. Two times. One is called the state of nature and the other one is called civil society. So civil society is very loosely the name for a circumstance in which government exists, in which property rights exist, in which semi-modern institutions exist in which there are rules and if we wanted to get real technical probably what we're looking at here is the establishment of state structures so civil society means a situation in which there are laws you have to follow them and if you don't follow them there's some institutionalized system of force which is going to come and get you which is going to compel you to do what you need to do, to do what the law tells you to do. 
by the way, it's pretty clear that there are certain circumstances where it looks like this system is kind of legitimate. Like maybe the laws are good laws. Maybe they were established in some way that seems legitimate. And maybe the, the institutions that enforce those laws do so relatively equally for everyone, etc. So we might assume that there is such a thing as relatively legitimate government. Anarchists, etc. don't like government at all. But it makes sense. You can, you can see what a legitimate government would be. And then obviously there are other cases where there are laws and institutions which enforce them, but those laws are sucky, they're overbearing, they uh, apply to different classes unequally, they originated with certain classes for their own benefit, and they are enforced selectively to the detriment of certain racial groups or certain economic groups. You can distinguish, or even if you can't distinguish, it makes sense that there is a difference between legitimate and illegitimate government. So we've got all those over here, either legitimate or illegitimate. This is civil society. What social contract theory does is ask where'd that come from? And it always does it by, by hypothesizing the existence of another time, another period, which is called the state of nature. And different social contract theories tell different, or theorists tell different stories about how we got from the state of nature to uh, the state of civil society. Rousseau, I think, in these two texts, is really telling two different versions of that story. And in the first, really, his real answer is in the second one, the, the text called The Social Contract. There, he says like what he thinks really happened. He, he basically sets out what he thinks establishes a real civil society as opposed to an illegitimate one, which is secretly just another state of nature. Um, most of these stories involve the idea that in the state of nature, Rousseau doesn't super emphasize this, but he does gesture towards it sometimes. The most famous of these is by Thomas Hobbes, English political philosopher, writing in 1640 or so. He's, he's the famous one who, who called the state of nature, uh, you know, life, the, the life of humans in the state of nature is nasty, short, brutish, and mean. Uh, he described the state of nature as a war of all against all because in that circumstance, there's no law. Uh, anybody can do whatever they want. And therefore, it seems as if the state of nature would be a circumstance where you have the rule only of the strongest, the rule of force. And Rousseau's critique in this very influential discourse on inequality is that a lot of things that look like legitimate government really aren't. They're still just rule of force. They're still just rule by the strong or, or by the rich, even though they claim to be something else. So he tells these two, two different stories. In the, in the first version, in the Discourse on Inequality, he gives a sort of description of this slow shift from an alleged pristine nature where we have uh, like noble savages who are running around naked and sleeping under the first tree and they look, they're, they're really happy. The sickly ones have all died, of course, so we only have healthy ones. Their bodies are really strong because they don't have a whole lot of technology to rely upon. They're almost asocial, according to Rousseau, which has got to be, you know, an historical falsification. I don't believe that uh, humans were ever really solitary animals. But, you know, like Rousseau said, he doesn't really care if it's true. Let, let us leave facts aside. This is a thought experiment. Uh, he tells a story in that text about how we move from this relatively happy situation, the, tr the true youth of the world, he calls it. That's a romantic way of talking. From this fairly happy circumstance with grand forests and small population, no technological development, small cognitive development, no lying, no pride, uh, not too much thinking going on, a lot more feeling. And you can see how these categories like, will become later uh, ways of distinguishing between so-called civilized people and so-called barbaric people. They're always supposed to be closer to the earth and less thoughtful and more driven by feeling and all this stuff. Rousseau doesn't mean to be offering this kind of um, dangerous conceptual device. Nevertheless, he is. In this story, as we pass from that happy state, we pass to a less happy state. And he says this is the reason for the whole, the whole essay. You know, discourse on inequality means uh, 
a writing about social inequality. He, so, and, and he distinguishes at the beginning, don't get confused, this is not a super important passage, it's just something you need to understand, that there's natural inequality and then there's social inequality, or what I would refer to as like positional inequality. So natural inequality is that my voice is lower than most of yours. We're not equal in terms of the pitch of our voice. It doesn't matter. And you don't need to explain how that came about, right? So, you know, my, I don't know what it is that makes my voice, my neck shit, <laughs> is, uh, is built differently than yours. We're unequal in that way. Some people are faster than other people. Some, are, some people are uh, stronger than other people. Some people take naturally to mathematics. Well, it, other people have to work hard for that stuff. That's natural inequality. But then there's social inequality, and that's what he wants to ask about. Social inequality or positional inequality means differences in terms of social position, social prestige, amount of power, capacity to make decisions, differences in terms of authority, where certain people command and other ones have to obey. And the question that Rousseau specifically says he wants to answer is, how do we get to a situation where it is often better people who have to serve worse people. It is strong people in a, all kinds of dimensions who end up serving weak people. It's often quite smart people who end up serving kind of dumb people. And it's wise people who are forced by circumstance and in the last instance by, by force, by the police, to serve the foolish. How did we get here? And so and in, this, in this text, the story is the story of a decline, and he answers it. And basically, you know, what he says at the end is that, like, well, where we got it, we could call it civil society. It's definitely a modern situation, different from his imagined state of nature when everybody was living in the wild. Uh, but we shouldn't really call it civil society because it's just another form of domination. We didn't really make it. We didn't make it to civil society. We just were told that we made it. And where we are is still with tyranny, with domination, with unjust domination. The discourse on inequality is a lament. It's a, at least proto-revolutionary scream about the injustice of being ruled by the rich and of believing that it is natural and inescapable that we are ruled in such a fashion. Rousseau really firmly believes that this is unworthy of us. We're free people. We ought, to have, we ought to live free. The second text is different. It still deals with the same story. You know, what constitutes a movement from the state of nature to civil society? But here he's telling us what exact form civil society must take in order for it to be totally legitimate in order for it to be something different than tyranny, in order for it really to be something different from the state of nature or the rule of force. And the answer there is it has to be democratic. And he'll say, he uses the term body politic. Body politic means a group of people operating together so as to jointly make decisions. Ultimately, people come to conceive this on the national scale. But I think in Rousseau's experience, you know, in, in the, the Swiss world where he lived, bodies politic were fairly small and fairly locally based. And I tend to think, and so do a number of our writers, that maybe you can't have real democracy on a really large scale, uh, which is not to say that we can't have it in the United States. It just is to say that the unit of decision making should not be the United States. It should be your neighborhood. You only have a body politic. You only have this new and magical thing in the world where a group becomes an individual capable of choice. You only have it if you have democratic process. Everything else is the illusion of a body politic. What it is really is the servitude, the slavery of the vast majority of people under one or another master. And in, and in that text, he tells us specifically how he understands the rudiments of democracy, which is voting, which produces the general will, which is what's good for most people, majority rule. And then he also gives us a list of things. He doesn't present them as a list, but I derive from this text a list of things. And you can find these, this list in the notes that are obstacles to democracy. What really gets in the way? Now, of course, the point of us looking at all this stuff, as always, is to say like, okay, might he be right in the discourse in, on inequality? Might he be right that 
even though it looks like the laws are set up in everybody's favor, even though it looks like we're engaged in progress, maybe the laws are actually set up in the favor of the weak. We've been duped. We're still in a condition of servitude. And therefore, what appears on first glance to be progress, on second glance, is really regress. That's the first text. And that, why does that matter to us? Well, because maybe that's true. What if that's true? What if the laws really don't stem from the general will in our circumstance? What if then stem from Halliburton? or Time Warner. This is one of the things I'll, I'll stick in the, uh, the video before uh, I pass it on to you. I'm gonna try and find something about um, net neutrality. I heard, I heard today that the FCC has voted to, to step back its legislation uh, guaranteeing net neutrality. And so corporations will have the ability to slow down and maybe even to select the content that arrives at, at you. If that's happening, that's an obstacle to democracy because it prevents the ability of people to get information and to get information equally. Obviously, also, it's a part of like a, a kind of large scale control of thought and behavior by corporations, which I think is really where we stand. So the purpose of both of these things, uh, both of these texts, is to bring these comments into connection with ourselves. Do we really have a democracy? What are the obstacles to democracy? Are these obstacles acting on us right now? How could they be improved? Uh, what could we do to make things better? Okay, so for the rest, I thought that I would just like to read some passages. So I'm going to start with the discourse on inequality. I'm going to start on page 13. Here is Rousseau making a declaration about the essence of humans or uh, about human nature. This is something that we should discuss. Freedom is a really important concept. It's an important concept because it might be a really important thing. I totally believe that. Maybe I've been indoctrinated by American ideology. Maybe. Uh, but I believe freedom is important. I believe freedom is real and important. And so we have to think about it. But it's also important because it's a term that is used all the time in totally unfree ways, right? We're told that we're free. We're told that we're bringing freedom to Afghanistan. When it looks like what we're bringing to Afghanistan is uh, detention, torture, and bombing. Freedom is an often used, illicitly used term too. So we gotta think about it. Here's, here's Rousseau distinguishing between humans and animals. I see nothing in any animal but an ingenious machine to which nature hath given senses to wind itself up and to guard itself to a certain degree against anything that might tend to disorder or destroy it. I perceive exactly the same things in the human machine with this difference, that in the operations of the brute, nature is the sole agent, whereas man has some share in his own operations, in his character as a free agent. The one chooses and refuses by instinct, the other from an act of free will. Hence, the brute cannot deviate from the rule prescribed to it, even when it would be advantageous for it to do so. And on the contrary, man frequently deviates from such rules to his own prejudice. So that's simple. You know, what's up with humans? Rousseau thinks what is distinctive of humans. Classically in philosophy, we would determine the essence of a thing as that which makes a thing be what, what it is and without which it could not be what it is. So you're looking for special features which differentiate one thing from others. And our special feature supposedly is that we have free will. Okay, now the story about the movement from the state of nature to where we now find ourselves passes very importantly through property. So I think he gives kind of two, in the discourse on inequality, he gives this answer in two stages. Here's the first stage. Here I'm on the bottom of page 23. The first man who, having enclosed a piece of ground, bethought himself of saying, this is mine, that means he thought of, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the real founder of civil society. So civil society is related to property. Super important for thinking about Marx and a whole lot of things coming on. From, ha from how many crimes, wars, and murders, from how many horrors and misfortunes might not anyone have saved mankind by pulling up the stakes or filling up the ditch and crying to his fellows, beware of listening to this imposter. You are undone if you once forget that the fruits of the earth belong to us all and the earth itself to nobody. So we have a a pretty clear distinction here between communism, collectivism, solidarity, communalism, uh, in very rough forms, and property and law on the other. 
So he's sort of saying, look, the, the systems of governance that we now have, they come from people controlling property. And the control of property is in itself a socially contentious and socially questionable thing. Because if, if certain people control, say, the primary water supply in our area, don't they have an obligation to share that water with us? There's more water than they can use. Everybody else needs water. Shouldn't they share it? But property rights say, well, it's totally up to them. What's right is that they decide. And the opposing view is like, no, no, no. What's right is that we all need water and we're going to take it. And that's right too. This division between private property and communal rights is identified here. Let's see. Next, here's uh, top of page 25. Taught by experience that the love of well-being is the sole motive of human actions, he found himself in a position to distinguish the few cases in which mutual interest might justify him in relying upon the, the assistance of his fellows, and also the still fewer cases in which a conflict of interests might give cause to suspect them. In the former case, he joined in the same herd with them, or at most in some kind of loose association that laid no restraint on its members and lasted no longer than the transitory occasion that formed it. In the latter case, everyone sought his own private advantage, either by open force, if he thought himself strong enough, or by address and cunning, if he felt himself the weaker. So I include this one, which is a little bit difficult to follow out of context, because he's, he's starting to ask how did these allegedly isolated animals, humans, proto-humans, Paleolithic humans, maybe? How did they start to form social groups and ordered social groups with rules? How do we get institutions and so on? It's like, okay, a, a first step here is in getting together, determining that a group of people have a mutual interest and that we can rely on the assistance of other people. We can engage in mutual aid and get together and make a loose association that laid no restraint on its members, a so voluntary association. I picked this because I want to point out that's, that's an ideal of anarchism right there. The idea that, well, we should just make groups and act together so long as it suits us. We should join into them voluntarily. We should leave them voluntarily. And, and hey, by the way, this is a natural thing for humans to do. We have always done this. We make groups, but, but there's a difference between a free group and one that is forced upon us, one that is uh, mandated. Okay, uh, next one, bottom of page 29. This is long. Uh, four paragraphs but this one this is the the pivotal moment of the entire text this is where he really answers his own question like where did we get most of the institutional social structures and especially the governmental structures which surround us how do we get a government how do we get a police force how do we get a prison system what happened to change between I mean, really, if, 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 if this was on an actual historical basis, we'd be talking about the movement from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic to civil, so-called civilization. You know, what happens in Mesopotamia, what happens later in Egypt, what happens early on in China, in these river valleys where people are concentrated and you have social hierarchy and you have kings. What happened? How do we get there? And here's in this text. The answer is like, well, we were tricked by the rich. Okay, before the invention of signs to represent riches, now I'm on the middle of page 29, wealth could hardly consist in anything but lands and cattle, the only real possessions man can have. But when inheritances so increased in number and extent as to occupy the whole of the land and to border on one another, one man could aggrandize himself only at the expense of another. So when resources have been taken over, uh, you can only grow your wealth by getting it from somebody else. Uh, at the same time, the supernumeraries, who had been too weak or too indolent to make such acquisitions, and had grown poor without sustaining any loss, because while they saw everything change around them, they remained still the same, were obliged to receive their subsistence, or steal it, from the rich. And this soon bred, according to their different characters, dominion and slavery, or violence and rapine. So if you're not one of the people that was lucky enough to get the resources to begin with, you either have to serve them, or you have to rob from them. The wealthy, on their part, had no sooner begun to taste the pleasure of command than they disdained all others, and using their old slaves to acquire new, thought of nothing but subduing and enslave their neighbors, like ravenous wolves which, having once tasted human flesh, despise every other food and thenceforth seek only men to devour. 
Thus, as the most powerful or the most miserable considered their might or misery as a kind of right to the possessions of others, equivalent, in their opinion, to that of property, the destruction of equality was attended by the most terrible disorders, usurpations by the rich, robbery by the poor, and the unbridled passions of both, suppressed the cries of natural compassion and the still feeble voice of justice, and filled men with avarice, ambition, and vice. Now there's a good bit of Rousseau's thought going on here. So we have unbridled passion suppressing natural compassion. Rousseau believes that compassion is, is a part of human nature as well. We have the ability to to suffer with others. I mean, this is what sympathy means. Sim means with, pathos means feeling. So when I see somebody get hurt, I feel something. I don't feel exactly what they feel, but I feel something. It's hard for me to look at someone suffering, and therefore I have a natural impulse to help them, which is not, in Rousseau's understanding, exactly fundamentally selfish. It's just built in that we're social creatures. And yet, circumstances can be constructed in such a fashion as to subdue that sympathy, to make it rare or weak, and to put other things in place. Between the title of the strongest and that of the first occupier, there arose perpetual conflicts, which never ended but in battles and bloodshed. So we have a state of war. This is a description of the, the state of nature as a, as a state of war, but it's a fairly developed state of nature, right? Like, so we already have property. So there's a perpetual war between whoever already controls a resource or a piece of land and whoever is strongest at a given time. Perpetual war. The newborn state of society thus gave rise to a horrible state of war. Men thus harassed and depraved were no longer capable of retracing their steps or renouncing the fatal acquisitions they had made, but laboring by the abuse of the faculties which do them honor, merely to their own confusion, brought themselves to the brink of ruin. It is impossible that men should not at length have reflected on so wretched a situation, and on the calamities that overwhelmed them. The rich, in particular, must have felt how much they suffered by a constant state of war, of which they bore all the expense, since they have everything, they're the only ones with things to lose, and in which, though all risked their lives, they alone risked their property. Besides, however speciously they might disguise their usurpations, they knew that they were founded on precarious and false titles. So the rich know that the only reason they have what they have is that they got there first, or that they stole it from somebody else. There is no real legitimate ground to their to their property. And yet they are the ones with the property, they're in a better situation than everybody else, and they feel like they want to do something to, to maintain this position of superiority. By the way, here's a side note. Here's a theme going through the class and be really important for the anarchists. The anarchists have the idea that, you know, the moment somebody gets into a position of power, they will feel that they naturally deserve that position of power. And the first portion of their efforts will always be put towards maintaining that power so that if others took from them by force what they themselves had gained by force they would have no reason to complain even those who had been enriched by their own industry could hardly base their proprietorship on better claims it was in vain to repeat i built this well i gained this spot by my in industry who gave you your standing it might be answered and what right have you to demand payment of us for doing what we never asked you to do do you not know that numbers of your fellow creatures are starving for want of what you have too much of? You ought to have had the express and universal consent of mankind before appropriating more of the common subsistence than you needed for your own maintenance. There's a whole lot of politics going on here, right? And there's, like I said, there's like a lot of proto-Marxism. The question about private property is a question about whether certain portions of the population have the right to control what is needed by the entire population. Destitute, so the rich don't, don't have a good answer. They don't have a legitimate you know, foundation. They just happen to have a good situation from their perspective. Destitute of valid reasons to justify and sufficient strength to defend himself. Able to crush individuals with ease, but easily crushed himself by a troop of bandits, one against all, and incapable, on account of mutual jealousy, of joining with his equals against numerous enemies, united by the common hope of plunder. So the rich man's in danger. The rich man, thus urged by necessity, conceived at length the profoundest plan that ever entered the mind of man. Here it comes. This is the trick. This was to employ in his favor the forces of those who attacked him, 
to make allies of his adversaries, to inspire them with different maxims, and to give them other institutions as favorable to himself as the law of nature was unfavorable. So he's, he's getting ready to use his opponents for his own benefit. He's going to use the poor to maintain his wealth. With this view, after having represented to his neighbors the horror of a situation which armed every man against the rest and made their possessions as burdensome to them as their wants, and in which no safety could be expected either in riches or in poverty, he readily devised plausible arguments to make them close with the design. Let us join, said he, to guard the weak from oppression, to restrain the ambitious, and to secure to every man the possession of what belongs to him. Let us institute rules of justice and peace to which all, without exception, may be obliged to conform, rules that may in some measure make amends for the caprices of fortune, by subjugating equally the powerful and the weak to the observance of reciprocal obligations. Let us, in a word, instead of turning our forces against ourselves, collect them in a supreme power, which may govern us by wise laws, protect and defend all the members of the association, repulse their common enemies, and maintain eternal harmony among us. Fancy speech, right? And what, is, what it's discussing is forming a government. We're going to turn, take all our forces, collect them in a supreme power which will govern us by laws. And the idea is that, hey, look, without government, everybody's at risk. Anybody can be killed at any time. But remember, the secret is that only those who have are really at risk here. And there's always more of those who don't have. So they're the ones who are really in peril. But they're speaking as if they and the poor are in the same boat, as if they are all precarious, and what's good for all of them is to make a government which will keep things how they are. Far fewer words to this purpose would have been enough to impose on men so barbarous and easily seduced, especially as they had too many disputes among themselves to do without arbitrators, and too much ambition and avarice to go long without masters. All ran headlong to their chains in hopes of securing their liberty. That was one of the most famous lines in, in Rousseau. They all ran headlong to their chains in hopes of securing their liberty. For they had just wit enough to perceive the advantages of political institutions without experience enough to enable them to foresee the dangers. The most capable of foreseeing the dangers were the very persons who expected to benefit by them. And even the most prudent judged it not inexpedient to sacrifice one part of their freedom to ensure the rest, as a wounded man has his arm cut off to save the rest of his body. Such was, or may well have been, the origin of society and law, which bound new fetters on the poor and gave new powers to the rich, which irretrievably destroyed natural liberty, eternally fixed the law of property, and inequality, converted clever usurpation, usurpation means like theft, taking things over, into unalterable right, and for the advantage of a few ambitious individuals, subjected all mankind to perpetual labor, slavery, and wretchedness. Okay, so what's happened is that the, the rich have perceived that all the poor are their enemy, and there's more of them, and they can band together and they can take the shit of the rich. And their solution has been to establish a government. They've done so by persuading the poor that they share the same situation as the rich. Here's a problem that we still have today, right? You know, there's this book called uh, something like The Problem with Kansas or what, what Went Wrong in Kansas, which asks why, like, you know, low income, largely white voters in the middle of the country vote against their own interest. Why'd they vote for the billionaire? Why did they vote for Republicans before that? Why, why are we confused? Why are we lower class or middle class people confused into thinking that we're just like the rich? Well, they utilize that uh, fiction. And then what they did was not just to put in place a government which was going to enforce their property. That's the whole point of law and government at this point. But they also, they take the working class or the, the poor people and that's their primary enemy, right? That's who the rich have to worry about because, like, the poor need to eat. They need to drink. They need a place to sleep. Their, their needs drive them to be dangerous to those who have all the things that they need. And, of course, the socialist view will be like, that's not fair that a few people have what everybody needs. But the, in this story, the trick is 
that the rich have taken the group of the poor and they've split them in half into those who might be a threat and those who will constrain the threat. So now we have police officers and jailers and judges <laughs> and, and, and so on. So out of their enemy, they've actually made an ally. They've turned the poor against themselves. We'll say that's it for the discourse on inequality. Now, let's move over to the other document. Now, the other document is about like, what's the real way to do stuff? What's the not bullshit way to get into a civil society, which really is civil, which is really a body politic, which does not just enslave people while making them believe that they're free, but which really allows them to be free. Okay, so here's how he puts it. Page 18, the very beginning of the text. The problem is to find a form of association, form of association is kind of like a technical political uh, philosophy term for way in which, a pattern according to which people are organized. Find a form of association which will defend and protect with the whole common force, the person and goods of each associate and in which each, while uniting himself with all, may still obey himself alone and remain as free as before. This is the fundamental problem of which the social contract provides the solution. So how do, we, how do you get a system where everybody has to follow the law, but even though they have to follow the law, they remain free? Well, if you made the law, wouldn't you be free? And doesn't freedom necessarily involve a moment of, of obedience, even if it's only to yourself? I'm going to quit drinking. I can say that. Uh, but if I don't do it, I haven't really made the decision, right? I have to obey myself, even when it's hard, even when my my impulse says, like, you know, screw it, it's it's uh, it's cocktail hour. Anyway, so that's that's the idea. Like, how, how do we have a, a law governed society with institutions and probably police and prisons too for Rousseau, uh, where nevertheless we can still be free? And the answer will be, well, if we engage, if we all equally and truly engage in the construction of those laws ourselves, that's democracy. The clauses of this contract properly understood, may be reduced to one. The total alienation of each associate, together with all his rights, to the whole community. Alienation means like separating out. For in the first place, as each gives himself absolutely, the conditions are the same for all. And this being so, no one has any interest in making them burdensome to others. So everybody's going to have to take their powers and put it at the disposal of the community. But then what we're going to get back, and these are our natural powers, what we're going to get back are like civil rights. Page 19. Each of us puts his person and all his power in common under the supreme direction of the general will. And we're going to learn what the general will is. It's basically the what is decided by the majority by a vote. That's the general will. And in our corporate capacity, we receive each member as an indivisible part of the whole. So he really thinks that we're making a new individual entity in the world. At once, in the place of the individual personality of each contracting party, this act of association creates a moral and collective body composed of as many members as the assembly contains voters, and receiving from this act its unity, its common identity, its life, and its will. This public person, so formed by the union of all other persons, formerly took the name of city, and now takes that of republic, or body politic. It is called by its members state, when passive, sovereign, when active, and power, when compared with others like itself. Those who are associated in it take collectively the name of people, and severally are called citizens, as sharing in the sovereign power, and subjects, as being under the laws of the state. Now here's where he starts talking about what I take to be potential obstacles. The body politic, or the sovereign, drawing its being wholly from the sanctity of the contract, can never bind itself, even to an outsider, to do anything derogatory to the original act. For instance, to alienate any part of itself, or to submit to another sovereign. Violation of the act by which it exists would be self-annihilation, and that which is itself nothing can create nothing. So, if so, so the body politic has to be autonomous. Autonomous. So, auto means self. Nomos means like law. So, autonomous means like giving yourself the law. Auto nomos, autonomous, controlling yourself. Self-government is what autonomy means. So, states. What this becomes historically is is countries. But what he's referring to is like uh, the uh, Greek city-state, which was much smaller. In order for them to be really autonomous, by definition, they cannot allow any external control. So obviously, if Russia significantly influenced our election, it's not a good election. We haven't 
actually engaged in an act of decision making because some force from outside did it. But this is going to be true also if different corporations or a band of millionaires influence that election. If outside forces bear upon the voting behavior of the collective, that collective is no longer really a collective. Okay, so page 20. In fact, each individual as a man may have a particular will contrary or dissimilar to the general will which he has as a citizen. Also, what's the general will? The general will is what is produced by a vote. Uh, the majority names the general will and voting allows people to make decisions as a group. But then once you vote, even if you voted no, you have to follow what the general will decided. And what Rousseau suggests is you're going to be compelled to do that by prisons and police and whatnot. So you may have a particular interest. His particular interest may speak to him quite differently from the common interest. His absolute and naturally independent existence may make him look upon what he owes to the common cause as a gratuitous contribution, the loss of which would do less harm to others than the payment of it is burdensome to himself. And regarding the moral person which constitutes the state as a persona ficta, thinking that the, the government is, the country is kind of a made up thing, because not a man, he may wish to enjoy the rights of citizenship without being ready to fulfill the duties of a subject. The continuance of such an injustice could not but prove the undoing of the body politic. In order, then, that the social compact may not be an empty formula, it tacitly includes the undertaking, which alone can give force to the rest, that whoever refuses to obey the general will shall be con compelled to do so by the whole body. This means nothing less than that he will be forced to be free. For this is the condition which, by giving each citizen to his country, secures him against all personal dependence, blah, blah, blah. So there's going to be cops and prisons and court systems and whatnot to force you to do what you may not have voted for, but just because the majority voted for it and you got to suck it up and deal with it. Let's see. Okay, more obstacles. Page 22, the top. If then the people promises simply to obey, by that very act it dissolves itself and loses what makes it a people. Remember how the essence of humanity was free will and decision making. If we sacrifice decision making and just agree to obey Donald Trump or the Koch brothers or Raytheon and Exxon and BAE systems and Time Warner and Apple and and you know people of excellence and people or experts or anybody if we allow a certain class to take over if we allow the system to just do what it does without actually making decisions which determine the course of our own lives we have stopped being a body politic we have stopped being a legitimate civilized grouping of people and what we have instead is slavery and to go further what Rousseau thinks is if and when there is slavery of that kind where our decision-making power has been renounced or it has been taken from us. Not only are we slaves, but because of our nature as free, we also have an obligation to revolt. Okay, so here's a description of the general will and obstacles to it again. If, when the people, being furnished with adequate information, held its deliberations, the citizens had no communication with one another, the grand total of the small differences would always give the general will and the decision would always be good. So that's the definition of the general will, the grand total of the small differences. So you add up the yeas and the nays and whatever, you know, wherever you have a surplus, that's the general will. But when factions arise, so ideally everybody would vote independently. We don't want factions. That's parties, political parties. But when factions arise and partial associations are formed at the expense of the great association, the will of each of these associations becomes general in relation to its members, while it remains particular in relation to the state. It may then be said that there are no longer as many votes as there are men, but only as many as there are associations. The differences become less numerous and give a less general result. Lastly, when one of these associations is so great as to prevail over all the rest, say like, I mean there's another way to think about factions too, you could think um, different groups of individuals naturally share interests, right? Like so farmers in a particular region share interests. They all need water, say, from the Colorado River. Manufacturers uh, share interests. They all want access to cheap labor, and it would be really cool for them if there were no unions, right? They share an interest. But if one of these associations is so great as to prevail over all the rest, say the 
the set of interests held by corporations, which I think is what rules us today. The result is no longer a sum of small differences, but a single difference. In this case, there is no longer a general will, and the opinion which prevails is purely particular. So you see there are all these different ways in which democracy can be interrupted. And these will be the two concluding quotes, and I'll just make a couple of comments and then we'll be done with this lecture. The better the constitution of a state is, here I'm on page 32, the more do public affairs encroach on private in the minds of the citizens. Private affairs are even of much less importance because the aggregate of the common happiness furnishes a greater proportion of that of each individual, so that there is less for him to seek in particular cares. In a well-ordered city, every man flies to the assemblies. This is going to be important when we get to Hannah Arendt and to the anarchists and so on. Like, you know, in a, in a healthy democracy, people care. They take part in government because they know that most of what matters to them will be achieved through this group decision-making. Under a bad government, no one cares to stir a step to get to the assemblies because no one is interested in what happens there because it is foreseen that the general will will not prevail. Maybe this is where we're at. You know, we're always blamed for being apathetic as if this was some kind of like personal moral failure. But maybe our alleged apathy is actually a form of practical wisdom where we realize it's bullshit. It's just going to be the laws. It's going to be the decisions. The FCC is going to back off net neutrality and the corporations are going to push through a tax plan and the billionaires are going to push through a tax plan which gets rid of the uh, inheritance tax and super lowers corporate taxes. That's just what's going to happen because we know they're in charge anyway. So why the fuck should we go vote? Now, I'm not just like snottily saying that that's what I think, although I'm pretty close to what I do think, but I'm saying that perhaps the apathy that we see is, is right and therefore that we have a busted democracy, that we don't have a democracy. No one is interested in what happens because it is foreseen that the general will will not prevail. I mean, how many, what percentage of Americans actually like the tax plan? It's like 23% or something. The general will is not prevailing and yet nobody seems to have a problem with this. Good laws lead to the making of better ones. Bad ones bring about worse. As soon as any man says of the affairs of the state, what does it matter to me? The state may be given up for lost. And then here's the last thing, and this one's really important for if we're talking about obstacles to democracy. Also, if you want to understand what democracy is for Rousseau, you know, number one, it's a group of individuals equally coming together and voting without influencing one another. But number two, it can't be done by representatives. Sovereignty. Sovereignty means the power of making laws. For the same reason as makes it inalienable, cannot be represented. Inalienable means it can't be lifted up and given to someone else. It lies essentially in the general will, and will does not admit of representation. It is either the same or other. There is no intermediate possibility. The deputies of the people, therefore, are not and cannot be its representative. So you can have like an administration for him. You could have an executive branch, maybe. But you can't have legislators. You can't have somebody else do your lawmaking for you. They are merely its stewards and carry, like the administrators, are merely its stewards and can carry through no definitive acts. Every law the people has not ratified in person is null and void, is in fact not a law. The people of England regards itself as free, but it is grossly mistaken. It is free only during the election of members of parliament. As soon as they are elected, slavery overtakes it, and it is nothing. The use it makes of the short moments of liberty it enjoys shows indeed that it deserves to lose them. So this is harsh language. We think we're free. We think we're involved in a democracy. We're only involved in a democracy insofar as we take part in real and fair and unmanipulated elections for our, our representatives. Only in that moment do we get a bit of freedom? And actually, if you think about it, there's probably no such thing as a free, unmanipulated one of those uh, elections. Because what did you ever have to do with choosing the people who were on the ballot? But at the at the at the most, it's in that moment of voting for the representatives that you're free. But from that point forward, you're a slave, and you're a slave because others decide for you. And to go again, you know, along the revolutionary track that Rousseau digs, if you're a slave, but your nature is to be free. Whether you recognize it or not, in truth, you have an obligation to revolt. That's it for content. Let me just list off the, the discussion questions that appear to me uh, from these texts. Are those who are in charge in our society, are they really superior? Is it really the smarter, 
more ethical, wiser, gentler people who are in control or not? And if not, aren't we in the same situation that Rousseau wanted to describe, that one that he wanted to work through? Some people think that, you know, an unequal society just comes from God's will. Like, that's just how it's set up. That's just how it is. You know, there are some rich people and there are some poor people. There are some leaders of industry and there are some uh, poor folks who have to just work a register at McDonald's. Is that just natural? Or is that the result of a social progression that could be and should be otherwise? Do you think that we're really represented at the governmental level? Do the people who work in government legislating on our behalf, are they really doing it on our behalf? They're receiving legislation that's been written by ALEC or that's a coalition of different companies that fund this place to develop legislation for their interests. If our representatives are being provided with legislation written by industry, pretty hard to see how they're doing our will. Do you think that a two-party system screws up democracy? And I think I skipped this passage. I wanted to find this one. But another obstacle that Rousseau uh, names for democracy is vast differences of, of wealth. Uh, do you think, I mean, we obviously have massive differences of wealth, the kind of differences in wealth that have never been seen probably on the planet before now exist. I mean, something like the richest six or eight individuals in the world now own as much as half of the world's population, the poorest half of the world's population. How can you have democratic decision making in a, in a, in a circumstance like that? Don't you think that that gets in the way of democracy? And then there's general questions. You know, do you agree with the idea that the nature of humans involves freedom, that like freedom is central to us somehow? And if so, don't you think that uh, humans ought to govern themselves? You know, one of the, the things I think is interesting that, I see, that I've learned from a whole bunch of classes like this one by talking to people in the class is that we're all told to begin with, democracy's great, democracy's the best form of government, freedom rocks, fuck yeah freedom, and we're all into it and we all support it. But, but then when we get into any kind of concrete discussion about actual self-government, people actually governing themselves, I find that people don't actually support it. Most of the students I have are really scared about the idea of self-government. And even though we'll talk without thinking about it, about the coolness of freedom and how this is the freest country and stuff like that, then when we get into a concrete discussion, I find lots of people suggesting, well, you know, people aren't really free. People just like to be led. You know, like they're naturally servile. Maybe there's a few exceptional individuals, but mostly that's what people are like. So on the surface level, we support self-government and freedom. On a practical level, we disbelieve in them or we are afraid of them. And my question is like, but hey, wait, isn't this something we really ought to take seriously? Isn't it true that freedom has something to do with who we are on the deepest possible level? Isn't it true that if we're free, we really ought to govern ourselves? And if we're not doing it right now, don't we have an obligation to change things so that we can? Now, historically, what you do there there have been different answers given for that. You know, how, how do we how do we revolt? How, how do we put a new system in place? Do we just take over the police and the prisons, and then we're gonna like you know make things better? Or maybe what we have to do, and this is where this course is going, maybe what we really have to do is start practicing self-government on a small scale. Start practicing freedom instead of practicing I don't know video games and some shit. Last question: When is insurrection justified? or called for. If it's really the case that we are not governing ourselves, if that's not happening, somebody else is governing us and we're servants. If it's against our nature to be servants, don't we have a responsibility to rise up somehow?